Hi, welcome to Smileys. So, Mora here. We are still talking Fall of Light and it's chapter 15 today. Uh, Lee has about 8,000 words, give or take. So, yeah, been one just, let's just sit it down. Uh, we have some drinks, we have snacks. Grab a drink. We just, yeah. yeah. A snack, a sweater, put on the AC, get comfortable. <laughs> it's going to take a while. Yeah. Uh, it mostly What's takes a while because I have... Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay. I think so. Yeah, it is good. It's very um, tight knit, like the last few chapters have been. It's very much um, one note in the sense that it's very about a specific region, about mm-hmm. the Hust camp and the uh, the Hust forge. The reason it's so long is because I am a nerd and I have taken an incessant amount of notes in what is supposed you to be a summary. You are a nerd. Oh no! Yeah, no gasp! Neither. Gasp! Yeah. And because uh, for the first time in a while in Fall of Light, this is actually encroaching on things I have actually been taught. I can actually talk about this without feeling an idiot. So, yeah. <laughs> but all in due time. Shall we begin? Right. Please, yes. So, uh, the, se- the summer actually begins off with a note, uh, because we're starting off uh, in a bit of an unorthodox manner by starting at scene two and working our way back. This will make sense when we get to it, and I think Mora did it for chapter 10, when we were discussing. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but yeah, until then, Steve, please bear Steve with me. Steve is just a bit sneaky. Sometimes he starts a scene yeah. and then makes it a flashback. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. so, scene two. I foresee this legion breaking hearts, sir. Oh. Yeah. Now, we are witness via a flashback of Galar Barris, which we'll get to very soon, uh, to the day of the Hush Legion's rearmament. Freedom was promised, with the charge being the prisoners donning of their kits. The tension in the air is palpable. The matter isn't helped by Castigan drawing a sadistic pleasure from making a show of war through armament, drawing off his old sword and presenting it to him. Galar's gonna have none of this, but Warda surprises him by preempting Castigan, accepting his sword and refusing the charade altogether. The sword, however, isn't having it either, as it seems to twist as though to cut Warth, and though Galar contemplates that perhaps it was some suicidal impulse by the man, he ultimately thinks that suicide is a task that required both willful stupidity and courage. Which is a bit unfair, but no matter. Yeah, yeah. The sword has now begun moaning, which awakens the rest of the weapons, which in turn makes things more difficult for the officers. When another officer steps up to take a sword and begins laughing, I think it's Curl, the blacksmith, which scares him shitless, causing him to drop it. Uh, and a command rings out from the group, ordering him to pick it up. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say this from Rebel, but I don't have any evidence to back this up. <laughs> in any case, uh, this hasn't happened before in all of Galar's years in the Legion. No shit. Warth contends that the swords have been driven mad, and though Galar protests, he knows Warth is probably correct. The latter also claims that the prisoners have lost their will, as though some may be mad enough to join in the laughter of the swords, Many are simply serving out of their sentences, and this is simply not what they signed up for. The commander simply tells Morris to make Rebel the next one to be armed, albeit Warth scandally believes he can do that, though he does comply, and then he returns to, Ran- turns to Rans, telling her that she's next. She seemingly replies that she doesn't like blood and isn't cut out to be a soldier, but Galar insists it's either the swords or the cutter core. Which, <laughs> yeah. Which is obviously definitely worth, yeah. Yeah. Rebel steps up to the wagons and collects up his screaming sword and, in response, screams at it to save it for the fucking enemy. The sword's moaning rises in bitch, eventually breaking into cackling. Everyone, Rebel included, is shook. Galar's gamble failed. Even still, he had no other option. The officers, controlled by a now calm Rebel, are lining up to take the blades, but nobody has the will to stand. Worth tries to make light of the situation. Rebel was a good choice for this, as he has no imagination, unlike Worth, that has far too much. Every soldier in the Legion knew the blades were alive, but they always felt... controlled. This, why, it's nothing of the sort. They seem insane, and if they are indeed, what will they do to their wheelers? Which is a very good question, and we should probably be asking before we actually rearm everybody. Galar thinks for a moment before saying that the blades cried out of the day after the poisoning, and just like the weapons... Many of the soldiers went a little bit insane, and some more than just a little. Yeah, that tracks. Uh, Warth also contends that the possibility of sorcery permeating the swords exists, but Galar wouldn't know. 
Still, though, the officers right. still resisted Rebel, uh, though they did as they were told. Galler even sees Rans, her hands red as if she'd washed them in blood. Pick up a sword, and Rebel comes up to inform them that this won't work. Yeah. If the sword were this difficult, the armor is going to drive everyone mad. Galar orders Rebel, who is a, which is a bad idea, to show some spine, and the man replies that he's got plenty of that, maybe even too much, but it's not the bending kind. If Galar wants him to do something, he'll do it, but he only pitches with his fists. In other words, if Galar keeps this up, Rebel's going to deck him in the nose, and maybe worse. <laughs> Um, on the topic of spine, there is a very uh, funny quote from Dust of Dreams, where mm -hmm. Tar, Corporal Tar, is very drugged up on some like drug that they, he's been given by the locals. Yeah, yeah. And like Lieutenant Quartermaster Sergeant Forrest comes up to him and says, "Like, you think you got spine, soldier?" And the good, the guy just, I can't even do it because it's written in a peculiar way. But what, like, what, what is this spine? <laughs> I'm a <laughs> fucking tree. Yeah. So yeah. that's how I imagine Rebel here. Okay. <laughs> the commander orders him to line up the officers and have them take up their armor. He half-heartedly salutes and walks away. Now, Geller isn't stupid, which, yeah, that's a good baseline, and knows that Forth has a much better way with Rebel. Yeah. yeah? Uh, much better <laughs> way with Rebel than he does, but the officer doesn't believe so. Rebel simply does what he wants to do, orders or no orders. That's how it is in the pits. They hold their crimes like shields, regardless of their strength. But they're not simply there for protection, but also what they hide behind. Which, translation, their crimes are the oversimplifications of themselves they seek. Or the coward, rebel the murderer, lister the wife killer, to reduce their own selves to their basis of characterizations so as to not face who they've become. And this will come up again a lot in this chapter. You know what? No. Now that you're yeah. mentioning it, I do realize it. Now that you're mentioning it, I do realize this is a prevalent theme in this chapter, right? Yeah, people yeah. trying to find their identity, trying trying to find their place in this. Since everything is changing, mm -hmm. it's nice, nice catch. Yeah, go on, go. On. Thank you. Right. And now what uh, happens? Even the regulars, yeah, uh, even the regulars have approached oh, have yeah, a look yeah. now, and the guards forming the cordon arguably won't hold. The swords even scabbarded till makes that awful noise. The situation is going from bad to worse. And then the heroes arrive. Enter. Enter At that moment, heroes. two yeah. riders emerge from the thin cordon, engaged in conversation, enough to drown out the swords. Dathanar points out that something is amiss, but Prazak replies that crows would chatter. He had a weapon once that chafed the during peace, but now it's been seduced by rust in the manner of old soldiers. All things end in their time, after all. But Only swords that laugh during battle? Yeah? What was that? No, I mean... It's P and D. They don't stop at saying just old soldiers. They have multiple examples for everything they say. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, what was? Can can you quote? Because I don't have a golden hand. God, sagging prostitutes and decrepit guards <laughs> with wavering voices. Yeah. Right. So, right. Yeah. Okay. All things end in their time. Excellent. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but swords that laugh during battle? Well, that is but promises to the enemy. Let us take off such blades, and at least with them, let someone speak for the manners of the civil war. Tathanar dismounts and commands one aide to ready for him a weapon that may crow for him in the manner of... of... of, of yeah. crows. <laughs> of crows. <laughs> crows, bleak and black above the battlefield, <laughs> trapped between grief and glory, between salvation and starvation. Promises, Prazak. Surely, these blades will speak to the enemy indeed, with the justice of their cause shrinking like a sack of nuts in ice water, while they grip and gorged handles and other so Daphna! You exempt about half the soldiers here from your analogy. <laughs> Won't someone think of the ladies? <laughs> Daphna I mean, they're accepts constantly a blade. constantly thinking of that, so... <laughs> <laughs> Daphna accepts a blade, and upon drawing the weapon, it starts screaming, which confuses the man. <laughs> Is he so ugly as to elicit such a reaction? Brazak offers that perhaps it's his breath, but that can't be it, <laughs> because he speaks with rose petals upon his tongue. Literally. <laughs> but if he understood correctly, Brazak spoke of the ladies earlier, his weakness, and so surely yeah. it is their strength that unmans him so. Therefore, if a woman were to draw such a blade, surely she would prove more fearless, and the blade itself would fear her and her willingness to see it tested, blunted, and nicked, perhaps <laughs> even made limp. Prozac concedes the point. 
Yeah, let the captains bedeck themselves in armor, <laughs> if only to invite a class of opinions. Just, yeah, this is how the rest of the scene goes. Just in case you're curious, it's like five pages of this. No, it's just it is it's so much innuendo. We're we're just skipping past yeah. all of it, but this is just yeah. extremely raunchy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Elegance, Prasik claims, was ever that in her suit, for he always looked dressed impeccably and was ever the envy of others, which I know I tweeted about this, but there's something so heartwarming about these two guys being so comfortable with each other. It is, yeah, you look fucking awesome, brother. Good for you. <laughs> I mean, you choose colors which are complimenting and boots are so polished. and You know, it's like specific yeah. compliments. Yeah. It's not just, yeah. you look fine, you look great. It's not that. It's nice. Grace, Dathana replies, was an acquired thing, and only by practice was he born into it. Which is a quote. For it is as natural as these perfumed and coiled curls in his hair. Yes. Oh, God. Anyway. And when they acquire their helms, and they do speak, why, Dathana will reply with a smile, as befits his supreme confidence. To that end, he orders the quartermaster to begin his distribution of armor, for does he not stand as one naked? Worth is maybe, baffled maybe. by this, but Galar is nigh ecstatic. <laughs> these are the finest if, officers of the Hash Blades in the Munch Company. Yes? Who are these what fools? What is Warth right? asking? Yes, come on, you can't skip that. <laughs> Commander, who are these fools? <laughs> Which, yeah, to be fair, if my commanding officer came in like that, I too would have doubts. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so, so Galar thinks it's Anamander has sent him, right? Mm hmm. The quartermaster's aides unveil the armor before Dathanar, and Galar notes that while prisoners are still crowding the scene, they no longer arrive as though in threat. Prazak then begins to give his finest speech to his soldiers. Your wise commander has given him leave to address this momentous moment. Yes, momentous <laughs> moment. Pray, Prazak, can you say that again? Oh, no matter. In keeping with your moment of momentous import, let them bring their own squad to the fore, so that Galar may see what they have done with them. Which just to say nothing quite yet, but there's no time like the present, which, if you think about it, makes utmost sense, as the past is dead and the future ever remains a promise. At least, let them kid out the newfound squad, and perhaps make of them soldiers, at least in comportment. Failing that, they'll just kill them all. <laughs> yeah. You know, that, whatever works. Uh, Brazak then coaxes them near, since, after all, it was their slothfulness that kept them alive, so they might as well display their officers' mercy in sparing them. The deserters slowly suffer into view, and the quartermaster unveils the armor. Dathanor starts on a serade about the armor, which is, yes, again, filled with innuendo, which I, has, again, have completely glossed over, because I need to finish the summary eventually. Uh, <laughs> he is more or less making fun of the armor's inherent voice, and then he invites a woman among the deserters to, um, dress him. The prisoners Dethrobe begin laughing, and, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. Dethrobe the prisoners Dethrobe begin Dethrobe. laughing, yeah. and incidentally, that's a bit later, but yeah, uh, yeah. the weapons and armor cease laughing, which proves that they're not right. They have no sense of humor or any appreciation of the softness of a caressing touch and such. And Prasak such. then feels secondhand embarrassment on behalf of his friend, but at least finds solace in that this scene of uh, what was that? Disrobement. <laughs> no. Scene of disrobement yeah. followed by uh, a robement. <laughs> Would at least prove informing to any virgins among the prisoners. I which mean... is... Yeah. Right. So, God. so, right now what happened is, it was an intensely tense scene where, you know, yeah. the bunch of prisoners are getting recruited into the hust and nobody knows whether the iron is like alive or insane or what is happening or cursed or whatever and instantly these two guys can come and take command of that whole scene mm -hmm. so it's basically like this um, what do you call like a mime show or something so just like gather around people it's like it's a performance right they just start doing mm -hmm. this performance and yep. they just exactly. i don't know it's, it's perfect it's it's so nicely done yeah they're very diffusing which is a skill that's acquired, and it's not easy. That's why they're the finest. Right? And that's why Galar's so happy to see them. Do you anyway, know how their skill is uh, developed? Hmm? By, by practice, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Only by practice are they born into it, yeah. yeah. Uh, while the prisoners then laugh, Prasak dismounts before Galar, and 
formally offers the services on behalf of Silcas Ruin and Captain Calaris. Galar inquires as to the nature of these soldiers, a wayward patrol, as it were, which, yeah, uh, and nice. offers them to the two. Yeah, I mean, if they said they're deserters, they would be executed, right? So, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Frasak is quite certain that none among them would be fit for offices, but they may as well maintain hope for some miracle, which is suitable to the fate awaiting them. Karkanas is a mess, <laughs> and Jurisander won't be waiting for the season's turn. Galar agrees, and orders Warneth to notify Selden, the quartermaster, that the weapons and armor are to be distributed to the regulars. They are out of time, after all. Tathanar then approaches, uh, fully bedecked in his host armor, which he claims is capable enough such that six soldiers could make a wall, and compares them to walking keeps. Galar concurs, host yeah, general's idea. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's great, yeah. Galar concurs, host general's idea of a new soldier would be a heavy infantryman made for holding a line until the enemy broke. With his new armor, they will add iron to their spines. Razak has informed the commander of their elevation, and Galar admits to some curiosity about what led them here. <laughs> it was, get the, yeah. uh, by now a classic anecdote of how they ended up here. Uh, Death yeah. informs him that their first crime was leaving a bridge unguarded, but worse than that, they malingered too long in the citadel and got plastered. They were fools <laughs> to so invite the ire of the White Crow, but no matter, for they judge it just, and therefore will seek to serve with utmost distinction, pushed beyond nature and into arcane constructs of obscure logic, which is a quote for sure as well. Um, <laughs> yeah. Their weapons <laughs> and armor are the perfect symbol to highlight the absurdity of the Civil War, after all. One day, they will be asked to stand against the impossible, and Dathanar foresees this legion breaking hearts. Ooh. Sad. So sad. Yeah. So, this is uh, the second note. Sandalath, from the Book of the Fallen, tells us that the Hus legion marched into Starvel Demolane and gave their lives to seal the gate. Now, uh, Fall of Light thus far has more or less disagreed with all of this. Starvel Demolane, per... I think it was male? Or tell her uh, oh. is a bay on the Sea of Vitter. There is no rent to seal, and the first iteration of the Hust Legion has already been destroyed. It does, i.e., the events that Sanalath are describing, presumably take place during the Sundering, which, unless you see Emerald be sundered by this point in time, we still have some time to get there. So, that and our assertion still might ring true eventually. Just food for thought. Uh, in the meantime, yeah. Galar leaves the two officers in command, for he must ride to Hust Forge and try to reawaken Tora's redemption to their purpose here, and perhaps inform her of the fall of the Wardens. Dathanar makes a passing comment about Galar and Tilliding and Heavy Burdens. Yeah. Which leaves the commander oh. dismayed momentarily before he's... Yeah, 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 yes. Oh. Yes. Will he ride him home, I wonder? Oh. <laughs> it's so... Like... They can look to Warith for any needs that they may have, and also, by the way, there's a killer in their midst. <laughs> um, <Yes. laughs> no big deal. This is some <laughs> random murderer <laughs> just killing yeah. the other murderers. Yeah. So Galar takes one last look at the Hanar and Prezak, the first with a placid expression, and the second looking as though he's about to dance, and reiterates that both are most welcome. Yeah. I mean, and the scene intrigue concludes. and mystery. Which keeps them young, right? Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was um, okay. So this a thing scene. about heavy burdens, yes, is one. He has this sad news to bear to General Hust and mm -hmm. Toras Redon and all that. But since we finished the end of this chapter, another heavy burden which delights him is, of course, Toras herself. So shit. They they had to sneak an innuendo somewhere in here, right? Yeah. They just yeah. have to. Okay, so scene one? Yeah. Pronounce me useless, and so bless my remains with everlasting peace. Oh, Henneral Hest. Yeah. He's so, the saddest of so course. far. No? Yeah. In keeping with that tradition, I am also starting with scene of the note. So it starts, begin, it begins before the flashback we just summarized, and it's cut in twain by said flashback. As such, mm -hmm. we'll refer to the scene before the flashback as scene one, so this scene. And the scene after the scene, 
of a flashback in As... scene three. Oh. It is still all technically one big scene since it's just yeah. you know yeah. it's yeah. Galler's perspective throughout. But for ease of summary and for ease of uh, recording, we are doing it like this. So, okay. in the garden outside the industry complexes that comprise the Hust Forge, <laughs> the master of the forge, Hust Henerold, sits with a rough wool cape draped over him. He has lived in a world of smoke, which blinds the fool to dwell in its midst, stings, and leaves nothing of comfort. He also simultaneously examines a piece of slag from a nearby heap. Now, this is where I said earlier that my uh, expertise well, yeah. is supposed to be. We can launch I'm going to geek yeah. out the shit in these two scenes, so bear with me. Maybe you should just, you know, once you start, if people are not interested, they should just skip ahead like what? 10 minutes? Yeah. 5 minutes? 10 minutes, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Right. So, smoke from yeah. smelteries often contained multiple toxic compounds, such as, among mm-hmm. others, lead, arsenic, mercury, cadmium, polycyclic compounds, Do you say mercury? and plenty of others. Uh, I think yeah. that's just me being dumb and trying to pronounce something else <laughs> simultaneously, but no, it's mercury. <laughs> so, yeah, slip of a tongue, my bad. I thought maybe your language has something else, you know. Yeah, yeah. My, uh, my accent <laughs> is not quite that heavy now. Um, yeah. Okay. Mercury poisoning is quite... Con- well, I think we've mentioned this before, but yeah, mercury poisoning is quite consistent with what the Thais describe as the loss of iron. Mm. Which, I don't know if it was like particularly widespread among blacksmiths, but it tracks. Especially since yeah. Hyrule has been a blacksmith for years, right? Like, yeah. way more years than your average human blacksmith. True, true, yeah. Galar tried, repeatedly, yet unsuccessfully, to ask Hyrule about the affliction of the Hast Iron... But the Forge Master continues on. They have lived in smoke all their lives. Symbolically. Uh, there's a lot of symbolism in this chapter, so I'm going to do this a lot. So, you know, yeah. Mm-hmm. The ash about is the last of the charcoal available to the Forges, and soon they'll have to regress using lower quality coal, probably lignite, which would lead to brittle, lower quality iron. Now, Henerald actually displays quite the impressive technical knowledge. Charcoal was indeed most often used for fuel and blast furnaces in the absence of other coal types, like coke. Uh, sulfur impurities do indeed render iron more brittle, which I don't know how they would know that. I mean, did like, it how do you isolate sulfur names? as the cause? They wouldn't have to know the... They wouldn't have to isolate things, right, to know whether it... Adding this, whatever... This type of, you know, this vein of coke probably leads to brittle iron. It's not working. Mm -hmm. So just abandon it. They don't have to isolate it and try to find the name for it and all that. That's the scientific method. So far, we have not seen the type. I mean, he does mention the name, though. (laughs) As like the cause, you know. Yeah, he says it's a sulfur, you see. Which is what's bizarre to me. Like, why does he know this? Uh, So you are the chemist. So how exactly do you identify sulfur? (laughs) Um, I'm going to guess it's like in veins throughout the coal. I don't know. No, there must be some like reagent or something. I don't know. How do Would you they know identify? That? Maybe. God, why does Steve yeah. throw stuff like this in between? No. Oh, don't. There's there's so much shit that just doesn't track, and Steve probably didn't think about them, but I did, and there's just. <laughs> We'll get to that in a very quick moment. Okay, look, you can boil it with a hydrochloric acid. If you take some coal sample and boil it, then you'll have a sulfur deposit. Mm-hmm. Okay? Uh, right. There are other stuff is all... And you can extract it with dilute nitric acid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah. Uh, not, not like impossible. The other things are all what spectroscopy and... Uh, Iodine yeah. titration, and I'm sure yeah. they didn't have access to they that. They would so. be, because that's how we do it. <laughs> Not the taste, <laughs> goddammit. So you are way too advanced to understand prehistory, you know, this type of society. So they just boil it with acid, you know. Yeah. Use yes, nitric sir. acid. Yeah. Look, you're learning chemistry here. Shit. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> now they, uh, the taste would then beat order into the world, and that would make music. But that music would either be too harsh or not harsh enough. As in truth, they are but middling creatures, caught in their delusions of grandeur. And what the tears may wet their cheeks are but signifiers of their irritation. And when the wind takes them away, it leaves their faces as blank pages. 
In that, is what Harold sees now. Each face is a blank page. He can recognize none of them, but it feels like he should, which is depressing. Yeah. Dementia. Dementia. Galler insists despite himself, but Henerald is in no position to answer. They are all born of smoke, both the dice metaphorically and the swords, literally, and are therefore imprisoned. Is it any wonder they cry? Henerald then makes an elongated metaphor with regards to metalworking, which, can you quote that? Do you have that on your hand? Yeah, which one? The four that's dying, that one? Yeah, the, the fuller's uh, bean or something. Bean? Bean? Oh, that one, right. Uh, where is it? Yeah. Born of smoke, I never imagined how it would feel. This imprisonment. Is it any wonder we cry? Wrapped in flesh, drawn down, muzzled to match the fuller's peel, bent and swaged, swaged, I hope, the patina writ like poetry. Yearning for a voice that might be music, only to yield nothing but cries of anguish. Iron is a prison, my friend, and escape is impossible when you are the bars. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, and then yeah. Gareth says he yeah. didn't believe it's alive and all that. Yeah. So, so for all the, the impl- people yeah, with yeah. their minds in the gutter, can we just say that <laughs> fuller spin just means like the opposite part of a hammer? Like, it's, it's a legit and a term. Fuller, apparently a fuller is a worker that works with cloth. Oh. So I'm not sure why that's here. Oh, actually this chapter has at least two words which are like not non-words like yeah. they don't make sense. filet and something else which you mentioned filet and uh, galley wax or something yeah 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 but that's p and d so i didn't really look fuller i assume is it's p and d we can think of yeah yeah fuller is a half round hammer used for grooving and spreading iron okay it, <laughs> didn't know that in weaving there is a fuller yeah weaving fuller is a workman who fulls freshly woven cloth right so then fuller is know. also yeah, fuller spin is yeah. very straightforward, very legit. You can use it, in, mm-hmm. you know, in everyday sentences. Right? <laughs> I'm sure you can. Yeah, <laughs> so my understanding of the implication is that the ties are forged in the same way that they forge iron, though, again, metaphorically. So, as Mara mentioned, the commander tries to play along. He never believed the weapons to be alive, which is something of a lie, or at least goes against his internal monologue in Forge of Darkness. I'm not sure if this is, is intentional or not. Uh, in his first introduction, Forge of Darkness Chapter 4, he just goes on, every soldier in the Legion knew the swords were alive. Everybody knew. Is it? I, mean, I didn't uh, know. And then he goes on to talk about like knuckles and heart lines and the blades and whatnot. But yeah, ultimately, Galar knew, or should have known, that the swords were alive. Now, whether or not he attributes sentience to them is a different thing, but he certainly should have known that they're alive in the traditional sense. But anyway, he had repeatedly told himself that there was nothing living in that voice, but others saw it differently. Indeed, for some, the voice of the sword became their own voice. Enerald interjects and claims that terror is but a brief span, and madness proves a sure refuge for iron and flesh alike. The forges are dying, and the age of the hust ends. Just as well, in Enerald's opinion. Can you imagine how it must have felt, walking through the nuded forest, with ravaged ground and filled with stumps, thinking that this is how things should be? Did he imagine, looking upon verdant hills of green, that he would one day turn them into such dystopias and but lick his lips? Enerald shudders at the thought that he very well might have. Which is again depressing. Uh, so depressing. Yeah. yeah. And then, Galar, yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Galar, <laughs> distraught by the condition of his lord, steps up and replaces the cape on his naked shoulders, noticing the tears streaming down the man's cheeks. He claims that industry is a force that cannot have worked against, that demands of progress leave no single man or woman to blame. If there is a crime, then surely it lies with their nature. And they cannot fight against their nature. Enerald is shocked into silence by this admission and asks Galar if he truly believes this, which... Evidently, he does. If not the host on the anvil, then others would take up the forge. Only the jagged displayed the proper courage and abandoned progress, but even then, their final congress was one of destruction. Now, I have a note here, as I do. 
Yes. Uh, General Tasfar has taken a very nurture stance on the nature versus nurture debate. Progress mm. is not a natural thing, as a dragon went on to show, and the dice industrial machine was propped up by their society's demands. There's nothing natural about any of us, in his opinion, which is why he's so shocked at Gal's admission. I will leave you to decide which is right here. But, you know, his uh, the ties are being forged, admission earlier, is, you know, how their societal norms affect their everyday life, and vice versa. Which is interesting to think about when contrasted with how Gal are things of things. I'm not going to be the one that does what is right. I don't know. So, make up your mind. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right, so the jacket, the jacket, the ones that unrivaled the iron and released the screams. So she told him, Chris, the lone as Athenai, when she came to him, the night after his gift to Lord Adamander, a night when he could feel his soul breaking. The realms, Henerald says, are bound, beaten, twisted, wrapped and folded, and ultimately quenched in the fires of chaos. Another note, because I'm a nerd. Hushed blades, according to the Book of the Fallen, are actually quenched in the blood of dragons. While we can be fairly sure that's not the case in Karganas, the fires of chaos no. is an interesting quote no. nonetheless. Yeah? No? Dragons are made of chaos, so obviously blood of dragons is nothing but chaos. Yeah, but I, where you, do they find chaos, about... dragon blood? What? Who? Where do they Sorry? find dragon blood to quench the blades in? They just call it dragon blood, but they mean chaos. Uh, yeah. No, we, we had yeah. this discussion about quenching in blood sometime back. And then we yeah. were both looking up, like, does blood get denatured? Or what exactly happens to blood if you're, you know, using it to quench uh, high temperature metals? But the point is, it's dragon blood is just a metaphor. They just mean chaos, so it tracks. You just take sure. the entire yeah. Malazan Book of the Fallen anywhere they've mentioned dragons or the ties history or anything just think of it all as a metaphor and i agree nothing I'm happens just saying. yeah <laughs> I no agree. i didn't not realize that you're talking about one. dragon blood yeah yeah no they well again like it's final i think the claims this but yeah uh in general the Hus legion is very mythologized in the book of the fallen for some reason anyway Mm -hmm. Within the Hust Iron, Henrol claims he had imprisoned a thousand realms or more. She showed him, with her horse of grass, her woven cloak, her rusted sword, that magic resists imprisonment, yet on he worked, unknowing and uncomprehending of the, of the extent of his crimes. One second. Pause. Okay. The forges are dying, and the world must end, all to the good. Setting a finger upon his brow, Anorald claims that she absolved him of his crimes. In other he dwells, where that is a sure and quick refuge. Uh, yeah. So, I have another note. I'm, I'm going to say this a lot. I have another note. I have like 20. Anorald speaks in metaphor a lot throughout this chapter, and we have no reason to believe he's being quite literal when he talks about imprisoning a thousand realms. No shit. Uh, but we do have a similar sentiment. Magic resists imprisonment and a thousand realms and more. From the Kimali in Desert Dreams, for in the eyes of the Kimali, all life is sorcery. Uh, even Karabas has similar thoughts in her POVs, which is weird. Um, something to keep in mind that this comes up before. Yeah. No. Okay, uh, now we're gonna get really nerdy because the Lord picks up a piece of slag and studying it yeah. inquires as to why they name this waste. It has been freed of the weight of iron, been rid of all notions of usefulness. Is no more waste than a corpse is, and it takes a cold soul to name such waste. Galler's at his limit by now, and all it begs the Lord to tell him what gives with the last iron and about the realms. Realms. Here, Henerald speaks it's of the beauty so... of waste, the freedom embraced by each discarded piece rid of its use, and each bone upon the fields. The curls of the slag as though smiling and relishing its own freedom. The smoke rising from the last chimneys, the sulphur and the mine coal, all beyond their grasp now. Just like the barren hills and the mined out pits, for this is the reward their industry promised. A promise of immortality, but the only such deliverance is one of wasteland. 
he begs Galar to bury him in this mound of treasure with his legacy surrounding him, make it a procession, born of ritual, pronounce him useless, and thereby bless his remains with everlasting peace. Now I get nerdy. Do you have anything to add? Only now? No, I just want you to tell me like what exactly is slag? Because so, you looked up, so we might as well talk yeah. about it. In a sentence, slag is basically the byproduct of ore smelting. Now, uh, if you're me, then you may have looked up what is the melting point of iron, and you would have seen that it's about 1550. Uh, and then if you're yes. also me, you would have looked up what is the average melting point of, you know, uh, a common furnace at the time. And you would see like 1300 degrees Celsius. And you would have put two and two together. Like, how the fuck do we have molten iron if it can't melt at the temperatures at which they have it? Now, if you are me, you would have studied for two um, years in chemical engineering, and you would have done a course on physical chemistry where you would talk about alloys and mixtures of solid materials. And you would learn that the melting point of a mixture is not the same as the melting point of a normal... Pure... Um, pure element. A pure metal, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Rather, I did know that. I just didn't think about it. I didn't make the connection. Now, um, basically, pure iron, as I mentioned, has a melting point of about 1500 degrees. What happens is that the iron oxides in the ore, your magnetites, your um, magnetite, hematite, stuff like that, is placed in the blast furnace, whereupon they are reduced which is a chemical, chemical reduced, process. Not oxidation, opposite yeah, yeah. reduction. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, by carbon monoxide to form pure iron and carbon dioxide, which in combination with the rest of the impurities in the ore, combine into a sort of weird spongy mixture of carbon, sulfur, arsenic, lead, whatever's in there, to bring the solidus temperature, which is the minimum temperature at which solid and liquid phases can coexist, down to a more palatable 1150 to 1200 range, which you may note is below the maximum temperature of an average blast furnace. I'm an idiot. Uh, <laughs> the liquid phase is then drawn out. It's cleared of impurities by the introduction of flax, flux rather than flax, flux, flux, which is often yeah. limestone, which is cal calcium carbonate, or other such basic oxides, to neutralize other acidic oxides like alumina or silica, while the solid phase comprises the slag. It is comprised of oxides, the aforementioned impurities, and usually the flux. So it's just a rocky, spongy mess. Usually. Yeah. Which is, well, I thought was metal, so I was like very confused as to why he's holding it up. Like, what do you mean it's rid of... No, it's, it's, just, it's just a rock. It's basically just a molten rock that's then just yeah. frozen and... Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. And for some trivia, a large bonfire reaches a temperature of about 900 to 1,000 degrees Celsius, a pottery kiln close to 1,100, and therefore it's not too far-fetched to imagine a civilization like the Taist mastering the production of ironworks once they discover blast furnaces. Which is just me geeking the fuck out, because, yeah. Um, so, if you skip Can that, I... great, hi. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Go on. Okay, see, uh, the thing is you're talking about iron, there is only yeah. one metal which I can confidently talk about because, you know, it's it's gold, right? Right, yeah. So the thing is, do you know, in like, you know, talking about uh, adding alloys and making it, you know, changing the melting mm -hmm. temperature and mm -hmm. all that, it is very easily done in gold because mm -hmm. the purest form, like 99.9% .9 purity of gold, is extremely soft. It's not good yeah. for jewelry making. It's, it, it's used only as, you know, bank coins. So you add something like copper or something to reduce the, impure, reduce the purity, which makes it easier to work with, but also raises mm -hmm. the temperature to melt. So mm -hmm. uh, other thing is I have seen them melting actually, like old jewelry, you take it, uh, take it to this shop, they melt it down. And the flux you were mentioning, it, it's a nice procedure to see it, you know, the whole thing just flares up and it looks very pretty. And then they melt yeah. whatever jewelry you have, they melt it into this tiny little block, weigh it, mm -hmm. and then you buy something else. So. <laughs> right, yeah. so that's one thing. Another thing, the husk forges are dying, right? So they're, mm -hmm. they're running out of charcoal, they're running out of trees. There is like extensive deforestation happening. 
so when this happened in the real world when people started like overusing charcoal to some extent by that time we had an alternative right an alternative fuel source mm-hmm. we all just switched to fossil fuel so have we seen any evidence of people seeing fossils or like any any such thing here in the thai world i don't think so the presence so of coal to such an extent implies fossilization is it coal it's a carbon yeah yeah but does coal require like millions of years of uh, i don't know how long it requires or what Because... conditions it requires but since coal is predominantly carbon it's not like it's something you find underground just lying there Mhm. No, I'm not Oxides sure. Oxides and ores, yeah, but not coal, yeah. Yeah, I'm just thinking like any petroleum related things, there's no way they could have gone there, right? Because yeah. There is no not. such. Yeah. They didn't have dinosaurs. I mean, they would need to like separate crude oil and then into the its workable fractions and what not, which <clears throat> I don't yeah. think they could be capable of doing as of yet. I think they're a few centuries away from that. Like in our world's um, yeah. chronology, they are a few so centuries away from mastering that. Yeah. Like who knows what if moons one actually runs on like gasoline or something. Like it has Maybe. an exhaust pipe or something. Who knows? Yeah, like uh I think it's Oscar that says that like uh, Ray hasn't unlocked like even half of the, the mysteries of uh, moons one. So yeah, yeah, maybe what he doesn't know is just it's a diesel engine. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe they switch to EV by then, right? So they it's maybe, just maybe, running yeah. on a single charge. Right. 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 So please can we Galar? get back to this? Yeah, let's get back to this. Yeah. <laughs> so Galar is shook <laughs> and steps away, bounding to his lord's back, and thinks how the loss of iron afflicting this man is truly a terrible thing. When such a man loses his way, they are all lost. He finds himself in a broad corridor and depicting the achievement, excuse me, the achievement of metalworking, denoting a progression: copper, tin, bronze, iron, cast iron to wrought iron, poured to folded, inviting a notion of triumph, of endless progression. However, not one of those objects on this place showcases the leavings of its making. No piles of slag, no bitter smoke, no stench of burned hair and flesh, nor of the environmental impacts of such work. Eventually he makes his way up to the last niche where a cast iron object should have been. Alas, there's nothing quite there. It was said, apocryphally Galar believed, that no such object welcomed the loss of function, the loss of usefulness, to be so reduced to a mere object on display. When the cast blade was placed on that niche, its roar was deafening and unceasing, echoing throughout the estate until it was removed. Uh yeah. Yeah. So now we get a geek out again. So- because he mentions all oh, that you stuff. Are, can i just yeah. connect two different yeah, things yeah, in yeah. the same because when they were talking about slag oh you can see mm-hmm. the thunder and lightning behind me yeah, yeah yeah so when they were talking about slag um hemerald says that it is useful i mean there is beauty when usefulness is exhausted right yeah so he finds beauty in that but whereas the hust iron itself refuses to be a mm-hmm. demo piece refuses to be just an you know a museum show piece yeah right and i really like this uh, corridor with all the metal working going from ancient to <clears throat> modern because this is how all museums work right this is how they display things in any yeah. museum but what steve is trying to show us is the the history around it right like there is so much which is lost by just placing one small item behind a glass cage mm-hmm. there is so much of the other things which are lost right so mm-hmm. this is a very nice thing to yeah. say okay now i'm going to let you nerd out let me listen yeah so uh more on the technical side so copper was actually the first metal that humanity was capable of smelting as it was often found in its elemental what is known as a native form in regular cluster, cluster, yeah, clusters now copper's melting point is low enough about in the thousands range i think uh that it could be smelted in a pottery kiln of the time unlike iron and since it's often found in its native form it required no further processing and it could simply be cast and used it was even used in the neolithic and as the name suggests chalcolithic i.e. copper and stone ages tin was often extracted in the form of its oxide cassiterite and alloyed with copper to make bronze and bronze age now bronze is sometimes also made with arsenic 
<laughs> since sometimes brawn uh, copper would have impurities of arsenic and when you would melt all of that together it would form a bronze alloy of um, bronze and arsenic interestingly as time went on that was more phased out in favor of pure copper so i'm going to assume that they would have some undesirable um undesirable yeah. effects that even like bronze age people who wouldn't like now I think, you, I think you are yeah. discrediting Bronze Age people and ancient people a lot. I think Just they didn't have the have tools necessary. Everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think they had the tools necessary to be able to selectively choose, but they could understand intrinsically what is good and what isn't for them and their purpose. So they would naturally seek out these things. They wouldn't have like a scientific method behind it, like hypothesis. The arsenic is at fault. Uh, yeah. But they would compare the two and say, you know what, this didn't work, this didn't work, and We'll try something else until it does work. Yeah. Uh, cast iron was actually the first non-meteoric iron alloy that humanity mastered. Now, I say non-meteoric. Meteoric iron, as the name suggests, comes from meteors. Uh, cast iron usually came from ore. We have um, seen meteor iron in Malaysia. In, in Tolder Hounds, uh, they would unend the, the, the Telanimas who was stuck in the mine, mm -hmm. Peter's Harlow, something like we used to use. Uh, the, he has a name for iron. He calls it something like sky stone or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has a specific name. It's, it's, it's a meteor, basically. That's the iron they used yeah. to use. And yeah, that's when I knew that oh, iron used to be extracted from meteors too. Right. Yeah. Oh my God, this is just a science class today. You're hardly You're reading, nerds, reading a yeah. novel. I know. Just one more note. On meteoric iron, it was often alloyed with nickel because the, the meteors would be composed primarily from iron and nickel, which would make mm -hmm. an interesting alloy in and of itself. But that aside, cast mm -hmm. iron was the first non meteoric iron alloy that humanity mastered. Um, the iron is alloyed with about 2 to 4% carbon by weight, drawn out at 1150 degrees range, and basically cast. Mm -hmm. It flows very easily It's molten, when it's molten, so it just you pour it into a cast and you let it cool. And that's that. And wrought iron was much more common in Europe, unlike cast iron, which was prevalent in China and East Asia, uh, and only arrived in Europe in the 1400s, which sounds really, really? weird to me. Yeah. Really? <laughs> okay. And it was often produced in bloomeries, the introduction of blast furnaces, which produced so-called pig iron. And there is a reason for that. I just don't remember why. It was how it looks uh, when it comes out of the why furnace. Why was it called pig iron? Yeah. I'll look it up. You can keep It's something to do with how it looks when it comes out of the furnace and like the different mm -hmm. bricks of the material would look like they are all bundling up against a single like uh, swine. The appearance like, of the molds like used to the appearance of the molds used to cast the iron into ingots. The molds were laid out mm -hmm. in sand beds with a common runner. Yeah, so the group of molds resemble a litter of sucking pigs, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the runner is called. So, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah, mm -hmm. basically, all this casting is done in sand. Yeah. Oh, uh, so, sand. that iron can be then. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Dramatic effect. Yeah. So, <laughs> that iron could then be decarburized, that is, have its carbon content reduced, led to, uh, which led to increased production of wrought iron. Now, Cast iron is an alloy of carbon and iron with relatively high carbon content, as we said, about 2 to 4%, uh, while raw iron, in contrast, is less than 0.05% carbon by weight. It's often Can fused with slag. Just do it without numbers. Do we yeah, need sure. those numbers? Yeah. It's it is wrong. I'm sure there are people who love yeah. numbers. Yeah, Don't yeah, hold yeah. back. I mean, I, this is my thing. This is my niche because, like, I the know, one iron I know, can actually I put this to you. But yeah, it is wrought in foundry forges where it is remelted, beaten, and drawn to remove the slag, as Henerald describes somewhat metaphorically. So, cast iron to me seems like to be an advanced form of wrought iron, which is supported by Galler's procession of you know, copper, tin, bronze, iron, cast iron, or iron. So, yeah, it's not steel, which is somewhat bizarre, as you would expect they would at least be making steel weapons, but they're not. Don't know why. Because it sounds so much cooler to say husk iron. It does. You have the same Never. thing if you say husk steel. Right. Yeah, true. 
Galar, in the meantime, stares into that absence, and for lack of a better word, he mopes. Thinking back to possibly <laughs> earlier in the day, in what was described in scene 2. Please yeah. continue, yeah, I'm just muting myself when there's a huge yeah. content, yeah. yeah. So, scene 3. Sad tidings, my love. He lives, you live, you live, and so do and I. So do I. Oh, shit. Can I just move on? I think that that covers the <laughs> entire section. That like yeah. nothing really happens. It's just sad. Yeah, true. Still yeah. staring at the empty niche, Galler slowly returns to the present. Still despondent, he likes to take a walk through the gardens as he had done earlier in the day when he would had witnessed the truce of Herald's impending words. The forges were dying, the blast furnaces were cooling, the coal was rotten with sulfur. The age of weapons itself was ending. Um, yet another geek note. Blast furnaces actually work around the clock. You can just pause them for a day and then restart. Why? The only time their operation ceases, because it takes too much time and effort and resources. Do you know something? Because... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, go on, go on, finish it. Okay, uh... The only time the operation ceases normally is when the fuel runs out, or when something breaks and needs to be repaired. I would not be surprised if the Hust Forge's blast furnaces had been working for decades. Yeah? No, um... Who's that guy in Told the Hounds? Barathol? He opens yeah. a blacksmith... Uh, bla I I'm sure that must have been a blast furnace or something, because once he starts firing it up, like, he mm -hmm. takes a long time, and then... You know, it's like a big deal that he has to shut down the forge or something. It, it's like yeah. a huge thing for him. And that's like an individual estate. The host a forge, like one. the yeah. entire estate. So, following some uh, abrupt technical issues, we are back with scene three. Sad tidings, my love. He lives, you live, and so do I. Still staring at the empty niche, Yalar slowly returns to the present. Still despondent, he likes to take a walk through the gardens, as he had had earlier in the day, when he'd witnessed the truth of Fenerol's impending words. The forges were dying, the blast furnaces were cooling, the coal was rotten with sulfur. The age of weapons itself was ending. Now, as we, as we would have mentioned, um, both in real life and in Malazan, with uh, Barathol, blast furnaces work around the clock. The only time their operation ceases is when the fuel runs out, or when something breaks and needs to be repaired. I wouldn't be surprised if the Husforge's blast furnaces had been working for decades. That's because but, yeah. they're very expensive and very difficult to get going once they're, you know, off. So, they don't turn off. So, uh, the commander reminisces on, on the irony of war. And their industry had led to the perfection of weapon manufacturing, but war led only to death and destruction. Yeah, that's what it does. Industry has made <laughs> them believe this is both natural and righteous. But one need only look to this place, filled with tailings, slag, and waste. Penrol was right. The only freedom is in said waste. He made his way now to Doris Raton's quarters, where she'd either been locked or retreated of her own volition following the poisoning. And even now, he can hear nothing of the forges. Industry's artistry and permanence was a lie, for industry was the mall that he constructed and fed until it burst. In the failing of its fires, and industry's death throes, rather than turn upon it, as the Jaguar had done, they turned upon each other. Why, a Thaist would rather die at its feet as if it were an altar, and hold to its sanctity until both it and they had perished. Another quick note, Galan had actually made a very interesting point about the altar being singular back in chapter 10, and yeah, Galar yeah. very convincing argument for that altar being the Thaist industrial machine. Maybe, maybe not. Nice, nice yeah. Uh, as with so many things, civilization's demise was built into its birth. Only the jagged proved that it was not inevitable. Civilization's death needn't be violent, nor was progress fated. He reached the door to Teresa's chambers and hesitated. He knew that when he set his eyes upon the love, he would kneel. Love makes him abject, and so it is right to curse it. But he also knows that he has to bring to her sad news. The words are no more, and Kalan Hussain survives. The news are sad indeed, but it falls to Doras to decide which of the two is worse. God. Ouch, ouch, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He could imagine himself speaking before her, flensing all decorum from his words, but could he be certain of her? She was drunk, after all, when they last met. 
to her appetite she was ever blind. She may walk in and find her recalling nothing save for grief, horror, and self-recrimination. She may well remember nothing, save for her lost chance to die with her soldiers, first on the night of the poisoning, and on the day after that, oh, she will remember well, Galar's sustained hand. A brave man would have let her drink the poison. Sad tidings, my love. He lives, you live, and so do I. And the iron lives too. Listen, if you will, to war's cold welcome. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah, ray of sunshine. Right? Yeah. Scene four. When we are done, Thank we God. shall make the Thank iron weep. <laughs> yeah. Pickets have been established throughout the Legion camp, so as to prevent desertions, but none have occurred since the distribution of weapons, and none indeed since Captains Prazak and Dathanar assumed command of the Hus Legion. The two men are tending to a private fire, and coming upon them, Farrer Hand was invited to their fire by Dathanar, who where she now sits. Galan once had called them his soldier poets, and Farrer well understands the honorific now. Their wit is sharper than she can comprehend, but at least, normally, their company proves entertaining. Not tonight, however, as this night was one for sober, and indeed somber, reflection, where eloquence did not belong. So it's a bit surprising that both Prazak and Dathanar immediately begin waxing poetic. Yeah, surprising, to be sure. Surprising, yeah. Prazak declares that in times of war, privilege is won by blood, or so it is known. Thus, Dathanar replies, this private fire, that is similarly to any peasant or low-ranking soldier, is a counter-argument to that assertion. Rank is an illusion. Prazak replies that the dung in his hand belies his artless grace. <laughs> Great. And he longs for someone able to tend to this fire better than he can, for he feels no heat from it, and not even Farrah's hand, fair visage, can steal the cold from his bones. Athanar agrees, as Smooth. due to the fire between them. Yeah, yeah. Smooth, is it? Oh, yeah. Dahanar agrees, as due to the fire between them, they dare not reach for her, but only dream. Farrer is simultaneously embarrassed and lost in the conversation, <laughs> and tries to leave, but both Dahanar and Brazak assure her her presence is indeed desired, her beauty humbles them, and they beg forgiveness. She replies that if she is to be reduced to a view, best she stays quiet, unless she fall in their regard, which evidently stings the pair. <laughs> well, yeah, fair. Yeah. Farrer sighs and claims that their burden is soon to be relieved, as Doris Redon is to return with Galar Barras. And, and yeah. would you be so kind as to they quote the next part? I mean, they are obligated to say such things. Will she ride Galar, Galar Barras home? I wonder. <laughs> and Farrer him doesn't know like how much these guys know, so she yeah. just blinks. Yeah. Right. She's uh, shocked by the question, but replies calmly. That Taurus's spirit ought to be broken, as when Ral was thorough in his treachery, but he did offer her a means of suicide. Should we count as a mercy? Prazak contends that the issue here is one of rank. In rare cases, the resolve of an army is enough to carry a broken commander, but decency dictates that a commander is to be the one that carries an army. A legion of prisoners, however, has a will and resolve that's too broken for any one commander to carry alone. Even the hush weapons and armor won't be enough, they need to find their spine. Pyro replies that they've done well enough, all things considered, and inspired confidence into the soldiers that Galar never could. Confidence indeed, Prazak replies, since 14 men have been murdered. Great. Yeah. Farrah contends that's because Warth isn't really interested in catching the murderer, and the duo concurs. Listar has been touched despite his desire to die, as the women about him don't believe he ever did kill his wife. The murderer, therefore, is probably a woman, which is indeed the general consensus. Uh, perhaps Horace believes that the killer will stop when enough justice has been dealt, but she sounds doubtful. Justice carries momentum, enough to maintain the zeal. Prasak agrees an army can find such momentum as easily as a mob, and then, well, too many men will die. They must hope for Taurus's eager return to them. They must hope that the Legion will have guidance into the future. Much of the responsibility to lead the Legion falls on the officers. Galar had very few options prior to the duo's arrival, which led to some suspect officers, including Castigan, a man whom Prasak and Dathanar elect to um, chastise, or simply slap him silly, uh, for his spite o and his guilt. Opprobration. What is, what is it? Opprobrium. Yeah, opprobrium. Oh, yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. 
which uh, basically just means you know chastisement, but you know it's uh, very verbose and therefore befitting. But Farrer also mentioned Rance, the woman who with the scalded hands. Each morning, Rance would heat a brimming cauldron and plunge her hands within before scraping them raw with pumice and lye, a ritual to remind herself of her crime. Farrer begs the two officers to not challenge this, as it's the only thing holding Rance together. Now, as we learned very soon, Rance is also the murderer that war is hunting. Ah, oh, spoilers. Oh, so, no. while Rance definitely believes this ritual to be in accordance with her need of self-castigation, it is also a means with which she cleans herself of the blood of so she slew. What is also interesting tell him so. yeah. is that her first introduction in Chapter 8, uh, she was mentioned as having red scalded hands. Was she? Yeah. I, I do think I pointed it out as well, which is, you know, it's curious. It's, it's those details that are interesting, but yeah. Now, okay. Daphne replies that they ought to burden Rance further. Do you, did you have something to say? Oh, no. Uh, yeah, that you can finish the section or just a very tiny thing. So yeah. how they say uh, there is what? Justice does not have, justice has its own momentum. So what Rance is doing, she is killing the people who killed women and children, right? Mm-hmm. So in the name of justice, once you start killing like legion soldiers or whoever, whom you blame for killing women and children, it's going to carry its own momentum. Yeah. So... Is it what Rance is supposed to represent in this camp? Is it where it's going? Maybe. I mean, it's it's so out of the blue to suddenly have like this dissociative personality woman who goes around mm-hmm. killing people. So, I'm just, I, I think it should die in some way. I don't remember what happens in the, lag, in the second half, so. Uh, yeah, we'll get to that. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a good point. That is a good point. Um, maybe, I, because they men- make mention later of, you know, they can't execute an innocent woman. We'll get to that as well, but yeah, maybe. See, it's all, it's all a metaphor. It's yeah. all just a metaphor. Nothing's really happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing ever happens. <laughs> it's also the fever dream. <laughs> so Daphne replies that they ought to burden Rans further and thus take advantage of that which is unbreakable within her. The Legion wields and wears madness. It needs its own spine. The history of the host is not enough, for the laughter of the sword belies helplessness. Their lot is a bunch of prisoners who have long ago rejected authority. There's a big difference between kneeling voluntarily and being forced to kneel. They will be cruel to Rance, to the Legion as a whole, even in comprehension of Rance's ritual being a necessity for her mental state. They will make use of a ritual to awaken pain, for do not the swords they all carry promise pain? All has been taken from these prisoners, and soon, um, rather, and some have made of their crimes a shield, as Warth referred to it earlier, or a shrine to attend to, so that they will never forget the reasoning for being here. All that will seek to evade responsibility, but ultimately, each man or woman here is burdened by what they have to live with. Loss of freedom is its own pain, and thus, the two of them will take advantage of it. There will be no freedom, not here, nor out there, nor in battlefield. The Hust Legion will be their promise. They live with pain, wake with it, eat with it, sleep with it. The Legion will be their way out. The Aaron laughs to betray its helplessness. But when Prasak and Dahnar are done, why, the Iron will weep. Parer is horrified by this and simultaneously exalts her deeds. Characteristically, she says that she faces two monsters and finds herself blessing their every word. That's right. the yeah, so there was this uh, theory about Edgewalker being Farrer Hen. Was it because she was walking the perimeter in this? Was it because of this? Uh, was it was it because she was a. As... I think the guy that made the theory thought Farrer Hen was a border sword. So she walks ah. the border. So she is. You ah. know, yeah. But yeah, yeah. I was reading this. Sure. Like, it sort of mm-hmm. points that, you know, she's walking the periphery and uh, perimeter and all that. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, should, we move, should, should we go on? Yeah, sure. We are... So, oh, yeah, it's the other scene, yeah. Yeah, so scene five, which... Uh, can you guess what, what are I'm naming it? this? Careless cock. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. 
forest lies in the stamp, feeling despondent, which is quite the theme of this chapter. Everybody's feeling down. See, they don't have adequate uh, antidepressants. I think that's all. Yeah. Yeah. If someone just flew in with like a bucket full of <laughs> pills, I think the dice would be much better off. For sure. Yeah. He wants a little more and to sleep the night off. But someone knows he's with him. And they can see him through the tense walls. And so to ignore the knocking on his tent flap would be childish. He had more bad news, which he didn't have to wrestle with while exhausted. It was no wonder to Orith anymore that most officers were oscillating between exhaustion and incompetence. Logistics would gnaw at his mind like there might Rand steps in. And Warith gives him gives a flippant what now, which shocks Rand and almost leaving. Realizing his mistake, Warith quickly and nervously amends it, offering her a seat. Her reasons for being here are undisclosed. She just saw him awake and figured she'd help herself. And yes, it's just <laughs> one of many hints that Warith will proceed to miss throughout the scene. She figured she'd help herself. Is this is this what kids are saying these days? No, no, no. She doesn't actually say that, but you know, she, uh, you know. Right. Uh, Worth indeed agrees that it's good timing that she should be here, and um, inquires about the habits of the <laughs> habits of termites. Yeah. <laughs> she just yeah. He has seen mounds, towers almost, of mud in the South Drylands, but in Coral Galen, they're simply known for their delivering ruin to wood. Now, there is some symbolism here to decode, but Warth gloriously missing the point is that much funnier. So yeah. we're going to do that instead. Rance carefully replies that one day she had indeed seen some wreckage caused by termites. She supposed the weight of the roof caused the collapse, and Warth pounces. Logistics. The lion's messengers are aching the termites, and problems spread like a plague through a sleeping army. The sergeant replies that it's been three days since the last murder, and Quarth explains that's because most people fearing retribution sleep armored, and because a sword left out of its cupboard will betray the arrival of a stranger. Indeed, as comes need no watchdogs, as a blade, or perhaps even the armor, will notify its wielder of an enemy, even if they're asleep. Alas, we can't sniff out treachery. Rance then says that uh, the termite infestation was a curse upon the family, since the father was, and I quote, careless with his cock. The, the rooster in his yard, of course. <laughs> and Warith, the dense motherfucker, with a straight face, asks <laughs> if she had anything specific that she wanted to discuss. <sighs> she is a trooper. She is an absolute trooper who's not like just shame faced, run away from there. She's still there and she's still talking, you know. Mad, yeah. mad respect for her. Yeah. She naturally glances away and tells him that Captains Prazak and Dathanar have summoned her. Worth apparently had no idea, which leads Rance to question what need they might have of her. Therefore, she concludes that she must be summoned in order to be dismissed. Which is a claim that Worth immediately disputes, for surely he would have been told if that were the case. Surely. He will accompany yeah. her tomorrow. After all, he had selected and thereby she had selected her, and thereby she is his responsibility. Even cowards, Morris claims, can display virtues such as loyalty and integrity. And I just want to say that like this, you are my responsibility sounds a lot like Cory and Arthan. And I was half expecting oh. like Rand to only like go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but you know. Yeah. There is yeah. an age difference between them, so you know, there's um, a a bit more maturity. Uh, he is, after all, painted too easily by a single hue. She agrees in that single hue of coward hide his other quantities um, and can even be used to hide behind if he were clever enough. And Warth's feeble attempts to claim otherwise little more than lies. Piles are like that, Warth says. Coward, murder, a title which makes ranch plans. But again, Warth misconstrues her. Seriously, this guy's just... Yeah. <laughs> Those titles belong to him and no other. He killed the man the day they were freed. But Rance knows that tale, as does everyone in the camp, and indeed the entire legion. Warth is again feebly trying to claim otherwise, you'd think he would learn by now. But he, Lister and Rebel, are all held in high esteem by the cats in the camp. They all know he's clever too. She then smiles, claims that she was here to inform him about Pratag and Athenor's summons, for they are clever, like Warth, but unlike him, for they do not cherish wasted time, 
God damn. <laughs> and to let him know that he will need to find a new sergeant. And then she leaves. Ornith watches her leave, wondering what that was all about, and no, why he didn't turn the conversation be back to the careless cock. It's... Yeah. Exhaustion, he reasons, would do that to someone, blind them to new ones and the new endo, and after all, he wouldn't append to the natural order of things. A bear he, a coward, and she, a child slayer, seek such tender and soft moments. Not for them, not for the prisoners here, and not for the host legion, such sort of love. For surely, those belong to the innocent. For them, for the guilty, even desire itself is a crime. The weapons can laugh for them, because surely, they are innocent and absolved of any wrongdoing. Except, of course, for his own sword, which seems to delight in the inevitability of his own fall. He knows it's coming, and would name it righteous for all that he himself betrayed in it. Great. Yeah. It was time now to douse the lambs and sleep, for if he had one thing that other cowards did not, it was a lack of abiding fear for darkness. But Mother Dark would remove in that. What blessing comes from knowledge? What do they lose from not knowing and not comprehending? No. Warith would kneel and worship the Mother Dark if she would make her blessing one of not seeing. Now, I have to just mention that my dearly beloved Asphalinus has a very similar thing to this. <laughs> yeah. In which he says, quote, Darkness for now and forevermore. So we can get on with things. Because in darkness, we see nothing. In darkness, behold, there is peace. Oh, nice. Oh, you just, you yeah. just, relishing just quoting Kadaspala, right? He's so good. It's not my fault. He's really good. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, do you have anything Two more to more add? Two more scenes? To uh, Warith's, yeah. Two more scenes. To Warith's utter um, it's... idiocy. <laughs> I, I get why? Really because of self recrimination no, Like, I, I don't deserve she, this, but come she is on, awesome. dude. I mean, she just lays it on so thick, like, you're so clever. You you saved lives. You stopped rapes. And she she is relentless and still no dice. No Poor dice. Rams. Yeah. The last but one. Right. What do you name this? Where in this wretched love is my reason? Oh God, yeah. Oh God, yeah. yeah this works. is the depressing one. Yeah. Yeah. Doris Redon sits beside a window overlooking the forges, with the blue of a dark night sky sits. painting an arcane script. Yeah. Excuse she sits, no? me. No, she stands. It says. Oh, does he? So, really? Sometimes okay. I don't have a fantasia. Sometimes I can imagine it so clearly because this is like just explained. So, Galarbaras found Doris Redon standing near a shuttered window shrouded in gloom. The window was one of the tall, narrow ones that looked out upon the forges. Yeah, instead of me reading it out, please do your summary. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, so the shutters are copper. Yeah. Did you notice? I didn't notice. Yeah, yeah. I did. I did, yeah. Ah. Um, yeah. The blue of a dark night sky painting an arcane script upon her naked form. Said form, having grown soft from an activity with folds of fat and rolls of flesh covering her previously hardened and worked soldier body. She had even Question. cut her hair short, which isn't an, Yeah. How long has it been since this poisoning has happened? How did she like go from months? a trim soldier to months? Is it probably does it take P yeah. months to reach the Hust camp? It's all still winter, right? Yeah, but the poisoning Four was before the winter. Max. The Hust, uh, the poisoning was it before winter? I think so. Wasn't it like okay, a while then... ago? Like, oh, okay, I'm like about four months, but like a month, probably a month or two. Two is probably too much. On okay. the half. Yeah, that then that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> she had even cut her hair short, which in an odd twist of fate ended up making her look more feminine. I don't know why that's weird to gather. But, but sure. I mean, it's usually like that, right? If you have a good bone structure, it makes you more feminine when you get a short hair. Yeah. So. so after a moment, Taurus turns to face color bearers and make mention of the night of the poisoning. He was swift to understand her intent, swifter still in thwarting it. You would think the soil she had eaten when she fell to her knees would be sweet, filled with wine, as it were. And given the poison was tasteless, Doris cannot, for the life of her, recall what she found so tart. Damn. 
Damn. Yeah. Uh, Galar amends by claiming that could they return to that night, he would have hesitated long enough. Thoras, turning around, with the script painted on her body by the night flowing, doubts his assertion, and so Galar has to switch tactics, and all but begs Thoras to return. She wonders how so he, that is, Galar Hussein, yeah? Galar Baras has two scenes where he's trying to talk to people, and they just talk over him. They just keep on yeah, yeah. giving Poor speeches. Poor fucking guy. Yeah. <laughs> All oh he has God. is like one one solid question from for each of them and no. They have to talk about so many other things. Right. Poor thing. This is why people don't like Arcanas. Like this exact reason. <laughs> because we are all Galar Barras and they're like, can we get all the things? No. I have to talk to you about slag. It's very important. <laughs> <You> fool. <laughs> yes. Right, yeah. We can mystery with all of you, believe me. Yeah. So <laughs> Uh, she wonders how he, that is Galar Hussein, would see her now. She's certainly not the woman he married, and she can see how Galar thinks her um, fleshy bits are soft as pillows, <laughs> but he's yet to experience their weight. She even invites him to a display. Now, the only reason I'm going into detail, in any detail, over this is because Renard is described very similarly. Yeah, The weight yeah. she bore would surprise people when she straddled them in the dark or some such. I yes. don't know if that's important, but I figured I would just mention it because, you know, maybe. Why not? Maybe he Why just not? likes them yeah. big. Anyway, oh, maybe God. Galan is just like into that. I don't know. I'm not going to judge Galan. Oh, have we just started <laughs> going to Galan now? You just skipped over Ericsson. <laughs> Who's Ericsson? There's no Ericsson here. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, it's Fisher and Galan having a discussion. I don't know what you mean. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So he hesitates, and Taurus replies that he must imagine disgust in her husband's face, turning him away from desire. Here he stands, an officer begging her return to duty in the name of the quorum. Fuck that. Let's dispel his fantasies first, and then she might, might, reconsider her future. Jeez. I mean, duty calls, so Galen answers. Yeah. yeah. She was sober, or at least as sober as he might get, and Galen considers that might be due to grief. Or perhaps it's simply an expression of there being um, more of her. Does it? Does it say that? Oh yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, oh, he God, does. Yes. Right. Yeah. Please. We don't need to linger on these sections, you know. None of this should be attractive, but a man has needs. What? <laughs> Torres is uh, practiced enough to understand the changes that have come to him and beckons him on. After all, what Galar longs for is dissolution and end to responsibilities. Others may deem that sordid, but they understand one another. Galar has come to talk about about Lord Henerald, but Thoris replies that he too has embraced his own form of dissolution. He and they but worship different aspects of the same deity. The end beckons them on. It's only a difference in scale. He pulls her into his arms, and Thoris remarks that she missed them. And because Galar Baras cannot go one moment before self recriminating, recriminating, that sounds like a lie to him. She was ever good with lies, and though she spoke not but truth up to this point, that last statement was contrary to Doris's world, where she only had room for herself. And so he thought about that lie, even as he would explore Doris's body and discover for himself the truth of her words. It was indeed difficult, and uh, the challenge proved all the more alluring. No love, problem, you know. We'll call Sorry? it love. Love overcoming social taboos. Love unto the bitter end. Love <sighs> in a world which has missed all meaning. Yeah, love. Agree. I mean, I would, I would, I have a lot of things to say about Galar Varas, but because I just like him so much, and I feel so bad for him, I'm not going to. I'm not going to call him a simp or anything like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I said fair. I won't, yeah. yeah. No, we're not doing that. Right. He's Later. just so Galar, yeah. committed to his duties. Yeah. He's so committed to making sure his commander comes yeah. back and takes charge. He will even do this, you know. Yeah. Do her rather. Yeah. What a great guy. <laughs> okay, yeah. Imagine if Rance had approached him. <laughs> oh, yeah. They could already be rolling in the deep, for sure. Okay, we were actually talking about uh, how much Varath missed all the hints. And imagine if Spinnak was in that place. 
I told you that Spinnaker would probably be in Rand's tent. Like he wouldn't be waiting for her to show up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For sure. Right. Right. Later, Galar would mull on what man he is. The commander of the Hutt Legion, the man he showed to others and indeed saw himself to be, or whatever Taurus had made him into, like a script scrawled across her skin. The knight writes him upon her in a language only Taurus understands. He loses all meaning, all sense, where, in his wretched love, is his reason. He knew he would return to Taurus to the, le- he would return Taurus to the Legion, and ultimately he would be viewed as a man of great resolve and heroics, but only in a timely glance from Taurus. Only a timely glance from her or from her would he be reminded of their hidden language. Which man is the truth of him? He has no answer. See, yeah. it, it sort of goes sorted and then it becomes so sad and you start feeling bad. Right? Yeah. It's, it's great. So That's a curious metaphor. But not unlike Serena's in the last chapter, it's a, I think it's a perfect distillation of the theme of love. That remains full of light for an exercise in the thought experiment. Substitute Galar's words into Draconis. Which man is the truth of me? Or any one of the three husbands? Or even the Kagamandra? Love yeah. is a language of full of light. And it is through that lens that it should be viewed through, I think. Yeah. Love. Yeah. We'll go with love. Like Narrative said last chapter. Yeah. We'll go with love. <laughs> <clears throat> Scene seven. As it stands, we are, and not to put too fine a point on it, royally fucked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With Yeah. Warth's hust armor is muttering constantly, which makes him intensely uncomfortable. He steps outside of his tent to find Rebel, who is similarly armored and, in classic Rebel fashion, cracks wise. Wearing this armor is akin to wearing your fears, and the blade is much like a wife. Beautiful until she cuts. Yeah. Excellent. Warith must attend a meeting with the captains. In the meantime, uh, following Rance, as it were, and Rebel casually mentioned that it was about time, which again goes over Warith's head. <laughs> and Rebel is off to the pickets to take a walk so that he may get used to his armor. Warith offers him to find Lister for his patrol, and Rebel replies that, for a coward, he's got uncommon loyalty. He's not complaining. It's something that gets noticed, is all. Warith, in classic Warith fashion, replies that Rebel would be better off listening to the sword, for when the time of battle comes, Kalar will keep him away from the front lines, and people like Rebel and Listar will be on the front lines instead without him. Rebel simply replies that nobody's planning on anything for him. No portraits, no paintings, no fucking busts either. They all know who he is, and that's what, and what he is. And Warneth replies that it's just as well. Now, I have a note here that Rebel's friendship with Warneth is bizarrely comforting. Rebel is very clearly a man that Warth can't understand, and Rebel is clearly very sick of Warth's penchant for self recrimination Even his backhanded compliments sting at times, but ultimately, they come from a good place. They yeah. know who Warth is. He's not the coward that he paints himself to be. He is loyal. He is a good guy. He is a good commander. He just can't accept him for what he is. Himself, for what he is. You can probably already see the echo of Galar, but... <laughs> That comes up again in a very, yeah. very shortly. Rebel then takes off to find Lestar, one more round before the breakfast bell, and Warren takes a walk through the camp, noticing that every soldier has their swords adorn their outfits. Is that all it took, then? Distribution of weapons and armor to turn every prisoner into a soldier? <clears throat> Warren is also keenly aware of the eyes that fall onto him and his cupboard, the one he has in his time of legion, and that isn't helping matters, because if you recall... It's marked as faulty, and yeah. everyone knows knows why this is. Because usually, it's like the blade is faulty, but this time it's the wear, which is uh, in scene two of the chapter, which I didn't mention actually in that scene. So you yeah, didn't see you it's okay, yeah. Now, and uh, for some god for second reason, his thoughts shift to Rance's words earlier and his murder of guns. He never saw it coming, after all, and Warth merely took his chance. Warth may be a coward, but he's no fool. Perhaps he acted before the coward within him had a chance to stop him. But in his mind, he doesn't know if the distinction is any significant. And yep, this, and Rance has seen it in a little bit, is very much an answer to Galar's question, which man is the truth of me? Ultimately, the distinction is somewhat meaningless. Each of them are but expressions of the same person. Love. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> he approaches the command tent, and Prazak beckons him within. He is joined by Dathnar and Rance, and makes a show of eating. Rance is very much not eating, and to that end, Dathnar and Prazak reason that by virtue of imitation and peer pressure, <laughs> they will incite in their guest a similar inclination to eat, and therefore invite Horus to sit and eat with them. Hmm. Perhaps this she is wiser than they give her credit for, as this sausage mocks the pretense, and yeah, I'm not going to summarize that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Would you like to quote it, or <laughs> move on? I'm assured... Uh, okay, he added, spearing another piece. I am assured that it lodges in the pit of the belly and remains silent, if not unobtrusive, until the moment of its rebirth into the world. Yeah. yeah. Hardly an image to stoke our appetites, Prasak. Right. We just had uh, poor just talk jokes, so why not have some poop jokes, you know? Or if uh, cuts into the conversation of sausages rebirth into the world by inquiring as to the reasoning of Sergeant Rats's presence. But Prasak replies that the issue is best discussed with a sated belly. After all, they must find a means to twist crime into crusade, vengeance into virtue, obsession into ritual. Warth, I don't understand. You don't? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you what don't? Is... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the dense motherfucker doesn't understand. <laughs> Once again. <Wait. sighs> it's just this guy, you know, rounds and forms him that it's to do with the murders. Really? She visited him <laughs> last night to give him a chance to act before the two captains did. He still somehow manages to miss the point until she turns away. And he realizes he's an utter idiot. Yeah. Okay. So how did she move the bodies? And what of her innate fear of blood? As it turns out, she doesn't know either because it wasn't technically she that did it, but rather someone else. She thought her habit of ritually scalding her hands would give her away, but Warth and company attributed it to another far earlier crime. There is someone else within Rance's body. Someone who walks when she sleeps, someone who murders people. All she has is lists, categories for baby, woman murders, and so on, and so they need to kill Rance to be rid of the murders. Warth feels sick to his core and finally comprehends why Prazak and Dahnar went around him. He likes, read, loves, Rance. He likes, read, loves, Nathan or Amens, the woman he knows, <laughs> since all he knows of the other is the corpses she leaves in her wake. Those corpses are shrewd in such a manner, due to the other being a mage, though indeed a feral one that uses whatever she has in hand to clean up the mess. Rance claims that she exists in a world without remorse, and that alone is grounds for execution. Nathan replies that the one demanding for execution is the innocent one, and thereby they cannot abide. No, instead, they deem the mage to be useful, and should she be awakened to her companion, Rand starts us down immediately. It's bad enough to know you're a murderer, but to remember it as well? Worth commiserates how nice it would have been not to remember his murder of Gans. Shovel in his hands, a blink, and Gans's body at his feet. Worth can almost hear the mage in Rand's, seeking to protect her um, sister. He pleads with the two captains to not merge the two. Dahna replies that yes, Warth only but sees this side of Rance, but what are the other? Cursed darkness and horror. As long as they continue circling about each other, a single question remains, and upon that question lies the future of Rance. Thereby, the only honorable and indeed merciful conclusion would be to spare her. Therefore, the two must be made to meet. Only the meeting will forgiveness be possible. And if nothing else, only Rance can make the killing stop. Nor can they execute and execute an innocent woman. Yeah, God, I can't speak. <laughs> Justice I mean, must speak not be seen to stumble. Yeah, 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 yeah. Justice must not be seen to stumble. And the ritual must be attended by all. So just like you mentioned earlier about, you know, justice and why is Rance here. This is one of the reasons. And, um, yeah. You may be noticing parallels to Ursander. I have not thought on them, but yeah, there are I mean, some to be made, to be sure. Uh, and whether or not you can draw the parallel and how accurate it is and what it means for both characters is a story for another time because I've not thought about it thoroughly, so you'll have to forgive me. Yeah. Uh, right. 
do we have anything uh just before we start the next one when rebel says mm-hmm. that lister is not seen i was so yeah. sure that lister is with dead like yeah he's the latest victim yeah 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 poor guy yeah maybe he would have been the next vi- victim because they just sent him to safety right right sorry continue uh, yeah 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 so said ritual would include a bone caster of the dog runners to whom lister was dispatched the night before it will be understood that a demon possesses rants one that must be extra extricated and exorcised but every soldier amongst the hunts among the hunts legion has their own demons and thus the ritual will speak to each and every one of them or if is indignant at the possibility of inviting a dog run of which they're midst because racism <laughs> they are the hunts legion servants of mother dark and that never concurs they are among other things royally fucked <laughs> Kalar Barris is soon to return with Thor's redone. What of her demons? This ritual is to make the iron howl and weep until they master themselves and their own demons. They are as nothing. The legion needs to be purged, and this is the first step upon the path. And Rance will lead them face to face with what she is. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the perspective shifts to Farrah's hand to close up the scene as she witnesses Rance and Wara step outside. The woman looks and feels sick, which is um, a merciful euphemism, as it were. Mm-hmm. Franzak and Dathanor had sent Lister away the, the day before. There were many rituals in this world, Farrah knew, private and public, honest and fake, and at some point during them, the participant is invited to transformation, to be embraced with belief. And those who are observing are invited into a similar participation, similarly, with belief. She knew all this. She also knew that in that instant, a mirror was held up, and a single snap from one reflection into the other was invited. And in that snap, an entire world could change. Listar, a haunted man who wore his accusation as if it fit him, rode away to the dog runners, a primal wild people that brushed shoulders with something feral. They are to be the legion. They are to be the legion's mirror, headdresses of antler, rituals of water and stone. And where, Farrah wonders, is Mother Dark in all of this? Right. Damn. Yeah. And thus concludes so, a chapter. Yeah. Just one. We just finished one chapter. <laughs> yeah. I feel like twenty, right? I feel like an entire book went by. <laughs> God. You know, we did break through the fifty percent mark of Fall of Light. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I think we discussed uh, it, enough. Do you yeah. have anything outside your notes to bring up? Uh, we did talk about you know one question that Mora had before we started this was uh why are these POVs like cut in the way yeah. that they are? Like why are we going uh, Galar, Prasak, Morith, then Galar again, and then Prasak again, and then Galar, and then. They, you know like galar just but, stands with the door about to open the door yeah. and then we yeah. have pnd and then he opens the door and then we are back to pnd that's how it happens yeah. right yeah yeah uh ultimately throughout the chapter we began like what it was i think was the last the last recording before we had technical issues that um this chapter is one of the chapter's main themes is identity and what it means to be someone like who, who am i basically and Prasak and Dahonar basically start off with like this. Galar concludes his monologue about like industry and whatnot, and they'll move on to BND, who arrive and start talking and whatnot. And then they move with Farrer, and we have this Farrer scene where they talk about you know who Rances and like how these different officers they have um, behave and what they have done and what they will do, what identity they will craft for the Hus Legion. And then shifts to Galar, who is like, what man am I? Where in this wretched love is my reason? Who am I? Am I the commander? Am I the man who I showed everyone else? Or am I this plaything that Thor's Redon has made of me? And the answer, spoiler, is both. He is both men. Um, the answer which is sounds always, very much like, yeah, yeah. It's complicated. Yeah. Um, it sounds an awful lot like Mr. Jekyll and uh, not Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Wrong way around. Yeah. Where, but yeah, see, ultimately, they're the same person. It's just 
two different aspects of the same individual. And Mr. Hyde is just... Spoilers, by the way. I'm spoiling the shit out of that book. Um, <laughs> yeah. Mr. Hyde yeah. is basically just the... Um, the mask, I suppose, that Jekyll don- dons to pursue his more indignant uh, desires, which... Since this is Victorian England, could be as simple as like visiting a gay bar or something like that. It could be anywhere from like murder and satanic orgies to holding hands with a no, guy. No, I'm sure it was like unchaperoned dates, holding hands maybe. It honestly could be a whole lot about anything because this is Victorian England and they have so many societal norms. Anyway, to bring this back to the dice, Galar has a very similar arc of you know who am I, what man am I, and maybe had the story gone a different way, he and Taurus would just run away from all of this. And then as um, the world ended about them, basically, they would soon realize that, like, I need to go back, but they can't go back. That's all what ends up happening. They He does end up realizing, I'm going to bring her back to the Heart Legion, and um, I will be treated as a hero. But is that what he wants? Yeah. I mean, and then we shift to Orth and Prasanga Dathana again, uh, where, you know, like they shift from what identity are we forging to who is Rance and who is Worth? You know, who is is Worth this coward he thinks of himself to be? Is he actually, can he display, can a coward display virtues of loyalty and kindness and compassion and brotherhood? Brebel seems to think so. Rance seems to think so. Warth kind of believes it in more like a deadpan and just, yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes maybe it happens. Um, but even Warth, the coward, ends up realizing that it doesn't matter who he is because this was done by him, not the coward within him, not some other guy who enters his body and just becomes him in some way. He is that guy. Rance is the foil to all of this. Because she demonstrably is not that person. But they need to reconcile. They can't turn away from one another forever. They need to be brought together so that forgiveness can be attained and that they can be one person. Um, yeah. And ultimately, that identity is one thing. And the second thing, as always, is love. Yeah. Sordid love, depressing love, sad <laughs> love, tough love, but love. Clueless. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Now, because Kadaspala is lost, mm-hmm. right, from the story, is this why Warth says something like, it's easy to paint me with a single hue? And is this why all these characters are losing their complexity? Everyone is being simplified. Ah. Very good. It's loss, loss of the painter. Very good. Yeah. I like that, yeah. It's it's good, right? I, I know you like mm. it because it's Kadaspala. <laughs> I'm a simple man. <laughs> no, you're a Kadaspala. Yeah. That yeah. is a great comment <laughs> we received. <laughs> I'm a Kadastan, yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I'm, uh, I don't remember what happens, but I'm curious to see uh, how the direction Rance goes because mm-hmm. it's, she she has to be at some level. She's just a symbol for what's happening with the dice, right? It's not just some random woman backbutting mm-hmm. and all that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious to see where it goes. Mm-hmm. I think by now everyone stopped listening. Should we wind up? Probably. Yeah. Do you have anything more? <laughs> oh, we don't have anything else to say. No, just um, we'll see you next week, which is also me. So that's three weeks with yeah. me. Uh, hopefully the next one won't be 8,000 words long. Okay. I hope. Uh, <laughs> right. Good night? Yeah. Well, yeah, good night. Bye. Bye.